Hello and welcome back to Forts for episode House of the Dragon edition. Today we are talking about Season 2, Episode 4, The Red Dragon and the Gold. Today we finally got to see what was foreshadowed at the end of Season 1, a full-fledged assault between dragons. And it was slow and dreadful and horrendous to watch, like in a good way. <laughs> When I picture the Dance of the Dragons, I picture dragons racing at each other like full tilt, super fast, lots of f flame billowing, and yeah, there was that, but like, you know, just like, I don't know, almost like I guess an anime in a way, but like, these are great giant lumbering flying beasts, and Game of Thrones has an interest in realism, and I think they were portrayed as such in this fight, and it was, it was so tragic, maybe, you know, partially it's to do with uh the the soundtrack that was on display it wasn't like fast war drums or anything like that it was like very slow low horns at least as far as i remember i just watched it but you know you know how memory can be fickle thing but i think the real the real tragic part that drove it home is both of the dragon riders and dragons who died being Aegon and Sunfire and Rhaenys and uh Melis we got scenes of both of them talking to their dragons before the fight and we got an impression of just how much each one loved their dragon and how much their dragon loved them back and oh my god when fucking Vagar came along and killed uh Melis and Melis's dragon looked into Rhaenys's eyes as it died and then you saw the look of uh you know loss and kind of like not acceptance, but like understanding that she was about to die on Rhaenys' face as well. You almost got the impression that she didn't want to live in a world without her dragon. You know, it was so sad. Oh my god, it was so fucking sad. Of course, Aemon's ambition here. He saw, uh, right, it's such an interesting character study because Aemon didn't set this up, right? He did not set out to kill his brother. He's an opportunist. And so when Aegon, prompted by Aemond undermining him in the small council meeting and his mother talking about how, as a king, his role was to just do nothing and let other people do the work. When his hubris and um, all that led him into the fight, Aemond saw the opportunity and he took it. He directly attacked Aegon and Sunfire. And I'm so curious to see how Kristen Cole... Uh, his character is going to go forwards because, you know, while there was a whole army there, in terms of, like, important named characters, he's the only real one who witnessed that. So is he going to... Because he's planned with Aemon in the past, right? Is he going to keep it to himself uh, for his own good? Or is he going to tell on Aemon? <laughs> there will, of course, be rumours about this uh, event from the circling from the soldiers and stuff. But yeah, again, it's been a while since I read Fire and Blood, so I can't remember what happened in the books. I think a friend told me... Uh, but it's, like, ambiguous in the books. It's just that their bodies were found or something. Maybe it's simply implied that Aemon killed Aegon here. But, yeah, it's it's such... You know, it really drives home the tragedy of this family conflict and the destruction it brings. Because, like, obviously I've talked about Sunfire and Melis and Vagar and their respective riders here. But you also see the soldiers on the ground and how, you know, at the start when they're just soldiers firing each other, they are, of course, opposing each other. And it's it's war's always terrible and tragic in its own way from just foot soldiers fighting and stuff, right? But when the dragons are fighting in the sky, there's this real sense of, like, they're, they're just there. They don't matter anymore. They just have to try and survive the fallout from this. By the way, I am assuming Aegon died. I know, like, he was kind of, like you know, rasping for breath at the end. He wasn't necessarily... Or, or, like, he was choking on blood or something. I have just seen a comment from someone suggesting he isn't dead. So what, do they just bring back a bit of burnt toast that can't walk and put him in the seat? I'm guessing maybe Aemond picking up the dagger there was signifying that he's gonna rule through a broken Aegon. I don't know, dude. But yeah, I like how Kristen Cole spent this episode kind of being you know, <laughs> a, a scary dude, and then he ends the episode being a shell-shocked foot soldier who just happened to survive, wondering what the fuck he's done. I'm really curious to see how the story develops from here, because of course we had Rhaenyra returning to um, 
Dragonstone, and she's talking about how she did everything possible to try and avert the war, but now she's dedicated. She can com- she can proceed with as clean a conscience as possible, and she wants to go, and thank, thank fuck she didn't, but Renice tells her to send her instead. So I'm curious to see how Rhaenyra is going to react to yet another beloved family member dying in this war. Maybe she'll feel less guilt at least, because she believes she's done everything she can to avert it, but yeah. I wonder how they're going to deal with Vega because god damn. When those dragons are fighting, dude, I'm on the edge of my seat. Like, I I just feel like anything is possible when I'm watching a scene of dragons fighting. Anything can happen. Okay, sorry, yeah, this is a bit all over the place, but I am so curious about Aegon. I assumed he was dead. Apparently he's not. So we're just going to have a very transformed King Aegon for, for the foreseeable. That would be really interesting. Maybe feeling angry at the death of Rhaenys, Rhaenyra will now take on a more kind of active approach to the war. Whereas stymied by the injuring of King Aegon, maybe the Greens will be a little bit more passive as they argue between themselves about who has the right to hold what power. Also, we need to talk about Daemon Targaryen and the spooky castle and his bad dreams. There is some skullduggery afoot. There is a uh, weirwood witch, a green seer of some variety, uh, doing some pranks, pulling some wool, not wool, pulling some fast ones over Daemon Targaryen's eyes. We keep getting these really cool dream sequences, and in this one um, we saw more, the episode opened with more Millie Alcock as young Rhaenyra, um, you know, sitting on, on the Iron Throne, and it's definitely kind of like uh, weaponizing Daemon's worst intentions against him, um, kind of like showing him a mirror of himself, and what I found really interesting was when he was chasing uh, that that uh, Targaryen figure through the halls, I thought it was going to be Viserys, and I was really excited, I was like, oh, I'm ready for some more Paddy Considine scenes, are you, are you kidding me? Are we going to see Viserys in his prime? Are we going to have, like, a dream sword fight between the two of them or some shit? But no, he turned around, it was only bloody Matt Smith too, but the really interesting thing is he was wearing Aemon's eye patch, which kind of implies that Daemon sees himself in Aemon and all the terrible things Aemon is doing, and I'm getting these really cool vibes from Damon in these last few episodes of like this guy he used to be this fearsome bastard kind of like getting a little older getting impatient getting um you know more superstitious as things catch up with him maybe not superstitious but he's in a literal haunted place I guess but yeah being haunted by his past you know he's being manipulated through magic but still being haunted by his past and um you know I love the uh, I, I guess I would call it a fantasy trope of like this old warrior who used to be super dangerous and unbeatable being undermined by himself and his own uh hubris i guess so yeah some super cool stuff going down in this episode um if i'm not examining it with as much detail as i sometimes do it's simply because i've had a very busy day so uh i've only just had the time to sit down and watch through the episode and i'm gonna leave it there for my thoughts i think i've said everything i pretty much want to anyway so thank you very much for tuning in let me know what you thought the episode down below um oh and alan i'm becoming more and more convinced i mean it's pretty obvious they they make it pretty goddamn evident in this episode that alan is a bastard of corliss's which i think is pretty cool and i wonder if we're going to see him legitimized i hope so but yeah uh that's all my thoughts i think so thanks very much for tuning in and i will see you in whatever i make next unless vega gets me she's a scary old lady